contributions. We will now move to questions without notice. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, I asked the Minister about a photo posted by LNP MP George Christensen, a photo of the Victorian Premier Dan Andrews, on his Telegram account, inciting violent comments threatening Premier Andrews' life. These posts were drawn to the attention of the AFP. The Minister took my question on notice. Can the Minister today advise what action Mr Morrison has taken in response to Mr Christensen's online activity? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, uh, Mr President, uh, I haven't received an updated brief in relation to, uh, to that matter. Um, I appreciate the Senator is, uh, has now asked on, uh, on a consecutive day. Uh, I will uh, we'll seek that information urgently. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Well, yesterday the minister also said he was unaware that Mr Christensen posted a video of Catherine King MP, which incited threatening comments directed at Ms King, and that post was also drawn to the attention of the AFP. Can the minister advise today what action Mr Morrison has taken in response to Mr Christensen's online activity in relation to this post? The minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, they were uh, indeed a, a series of, uh, of related questions from Senator Keneally yesterday. Um, I refer to my previous remarks there. Senator Keneally, order. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary. Yesterday, the Commissioner of the Australian Federal Police revealed he's been investigating various threats against parliamentarians. Why hasn't the Prime Minister publicly condemned Mr Christensen's posts, which incited those very threats of violence? And will he? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, I am uh, certainly not aware that uh, anything the AFP Commissioner has said relates specifically to the matters Senator Keneally has raised. Um, uh, as I've indicated, uh, I acknowledge the questions have been asked on consecutive days. I haven't received an update uh, in relation to these matters since yesterday, where I undertook to provide any information back to the chamber, uh, but I will urgently seek such an update. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Liberal and Nationals government national plan to safely reopen Australia is reuniting families and securing our economic recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hughes for the question. Mr President, on both the health and economic fronts, Australia has fared far better than most countries when it comes to dealing with COVID-19. And what we are now seeing is that it is very pleasing that Australia is again reopening to the world. The incredibly high vaccination rate that we have in Australia has now meant that we can take further steps as a country to safely reopen. We see today from South Australia. South Australia is safely reopening. And uh, certainly the comments that I've had, it is fantastic to see more and more of the internal borders coming down as states and territories continue to have increased vaccination rates. And certainly to all Australians out there uh, who have gone and got themselves vaccinated, uh, we certainly thank you. What we see with the borders coming down and Australia reopening up is it's allowing families to reunite. It also has an important economic benefit for businesses in terms of finding staff and making it easier to do business, as we know, between the states and territories. The continued safe reopening is important for Australia to continue securing our economic future. Mr President, Australia's economic recovery, as we know, it is graining pace with the RBA upgrading its growth forecast for 2022 from 4.25 per cent to 5.5 per cent, and unemployment is set to continually fall to be sustainably with a four in front of it. And certainly that's why you've seen the announcement from the 1st of December this year, we are now welcoming back fully vaccinated eligible visa holders to Australia without them needing to apply for a travel exemption. And this means eligible visa holders, including skilled workers, students and humanitarian, temporary working holiday makers and provisional family visa holders, they will now all be able to come to Australia, and Minister, that's a good thing. Your time has expired. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you. 
How will the expanded travel bubbles help Australia's travel industry to recover, including in rural and regional areas? Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. In terms of tourism, uh, in the financial year 2018-19, Australia actually generated $60.8 billion in direct tourism gross domestic product, and the industry itself directly employed over 670,000 Australians. 44 cents of every tourism dollar is spent in regional Australia. Um, and that is obviously a very, very good thing for our regional friends. And that is why safely reopening Australia is just so important, not just for our major capital cities, but also holiday destinations, as we all know, like Coffs Harbour and Port Douglas. Mr President, the Singapore Safe Travel Zone, it actually commenced on the 21st of November. It's opening. We are now welcoming eligible travellers into Australia from Singapore. And as we know, with the announcement by the Prime Minister on the 1st of December, we will now welcome citizens from Japan and Korea. Again, we are safely reopening and in doing so, Minister, we are welcoming well people on. back to Time Australia. Has expired. Senator Hughes, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. With Australia being the third most popular education destination globally, how will the reopening help our education sector continue to secure international borders? This international students, sorry. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. And I think, as we all know, international education is Australia's fourth biggest export, and it contributes around $40 billion to the Australian economy. Normally, there are around 680,000 international students in Australia, uh, and without a doubt, they certainly contribute to uh, our city's livelihoods. This is a cohort who, on top of the fees that they pay, spend considerable money on accommodation, on leisure, and, as we know, they support many of our small and family businesses, uh, not just in our cities, but when they travel into rural and regional Australia. Mr President, what we are seeing with the safe reopening of Australia, it really does demonstrate the success uh, of our national plan as the government continues to work with Australians to get Australia back to normal and reopen Australia to the world. As the Prime Minister himself said yesterday, it is another win for Australians who want to see Australia return to some form of normality that we knew before COVID-19. Your time has expired. Uh, Senator Murray L. Smith. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Why did Mr Morrison say in question time yesterday that he told the Leader of the Opposition where he was going on holiday while bushfires raged across the country when he had not? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, I thank the Senator for the question. Uh, Mr Morrison, I believe, addressed those matters in the House of Representatives yesterday afternoon, and I draw the Senator's attention to the Hansard. Order. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Why did Mr Morrison then stand up for a second time and double down on his comments, even though they were not true? Minister. I refer to my previous answer. Senator Smith, a second supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that more than an hour after falsely claiming he had told the opposition leader where he was going on holiday, and only after the leader of the opposition had left the chamber, Mr Morrison stood up for a third time to correct the record? Why does Mr Morrison have so much trouble telling the truth? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, in, indeed, Mr. Morrison did address, as I said in my primary answer, those issues when he stood in the House yesterday afternoon. But of course, those opposite, predictably, as I thought might be the case, are seeking, as always, to play the man. Their ambition is to play the man, not the ball. Their ambition is to make sure that they get to run the grubbiest, most personal election campaign possible uh, without any resort on their part to policies, to values, to any of the types of things that might actually be to the benefit of the Australian people. Mr President, we can see this in terms of the tactics the Labor Party are playing day in, day out. You can hear the talking points in every interview that comes along, where every time one of them is up, it's usually not Mr Albanese because they keep in a box somewhere. But when any of the rest of them are out there, they've of course all got their scripted attacks and each of them go straight to the personal, straight to try to besmirch the Prime Minister, straight to try to make sure that they go 
undermining him in whatever way they possibly can. That's the Minister, type of grubbiness we no doubt Minister, will see from those Minister, opposite from now till polling Minister, day. the time for the answer has expired. Senator Cox. Thank you. My question is to Minister representing the Minister for Resources and Water, Senator Rushton. Uh, yesterday, Woodside gave the green light to the Scarborough Gas Project, which will generate 1.6 billion tonnes of emissions, equivalent to 15 coal-fired power stations every year. Scarborough will be the most polluting gas project in all of Australia. Minister, how could the Morrison government approve the most fossil fuel polluting project ever proposed in Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Water and Resources, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Mr President, and, uh, and I thank the Senator for her question. Um, the one thing that the Morrison-Joyce government will do is to ensure that the resources that are the wealth of Australia are able to be prosecuted to ensure that all Australians benefit from the wealth that sits yeah. under our ground. And we will do so in a responsible way, a way that's responsible when it comes to our emissions targets, a way that is responsible when it comes to making sure that we have got reliable and affordable power, because we are not going to make the Australian public or Australian businesses uh, pay for uh, the future that we know that we can achieve through our technology-led recovery. And I always wonder when we get questions from the Greens what they hate about regional Australia. What do they hate about jobs? What do they hate about businesses? I mean, this government has made an absolute commitment towards net zero by 2050. But we're going to do it in a way that is responsible, a way that doesn't tax Australians, Australian families, Australian households and Australian businesses. And we're absolutely committed to that. We are technology uh, uh, and, and source agnostic. We just believe that technology is the answer and not taxes. So I really don't understand why you are so against rural and regional Australia being able to benefit from the opportunity of jobs and the development yeah, of businesses, yeah. why you are denying the Australian public the opportunity to realise the wealth that exists under our ground. Because as you may not actually realise, in rural and regional Australia, we have two great industries. We have our resources sector and we have our agricultural sector. And these two sectors have been the backbone of the Australian economy for a very long time. They are two of the most responsible, environmentally responsible industries, and we on this side of the chamber will back them in for the benefit of all Australians. Senator Cox, a supplementary question. Uh, Woodside donates $220,000 every single year to the Liberal and the Labor parties. Former Liberal Resources Minister Ian McFarlane and former Labor WA State Treasurer Ben Wyatt both sit on their board. Minister, who is responsible for setting gas policy in this country? Is it Woodside or is it the government? Minister. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I'm really pleased to let Senator Cox know that it's the government that sets policy in Australia. And it's not just energy policy, but all national policy is set by the government. Now, you may not like it because you want to protest about everything that happens in this country, but we on this side of the chamber Order. are very happy to have the privilege and the honour to set policy to support Australians. We set policy through COVID that got us through COVID uh, safely um, and making sure that our economy re re remains sound. And what we will continue to do as we set policy going forward is to make sure that the best interests of Australia, of our economy, Order. of the health and safety of our citizens, of our national interests are always protected by the policies that Order. this government will always put forward. So I can assure you that your grubby attempt to try and besmirch and, and uh, um, the, uh, the policy of this government Order. is not working because this government will always make Minister, policy in the best interests of Minister, Australia. Minister, your time has expired. Just before we go on, it, it is difficult for me to hear the minister, and she is only a couple of metres away from me. So I would remind all senators that interjections are disorderly. Senator Cox, second supplementary. The highly acidic gases from the Scarborough project will destroy First Nations cultural heritage at Murrajuga, not only the rock art, but also the song lines of the Seven Sisters Dreaming story that are etched in the rocks at Murrajuga. Traditional owners have said no over and over to this project and are asking for it to be stopped. Why is the Commonwealth enabling the continued destruction of the Murrajuga rock art at the hands of the Woodside 
Scarborough Gas Project. Handy. Minister. Order. Senator Thorpe, order. Minister. Well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I, I would disagree with the premise of the um, accusations that Senator Cox, Senator Cox has just made. Um, we, uh, in the development of our resource sector, um, of course, we must always remain very, very alive um, to the issues of, uh, of Indigenous culture in Australia. Um, and I can absolutely assure this chamber and anybody listening that that is always one of the absolute key considerations when we develop this sector. But the, the, the resource sector is a very important Order. element of the Australian economy. It benefits all Australians, uh, including Indigenous so Australians, our First Nations Australians, Order benefit from our right resources and sector. And we will continue to work in a process of co-design, consulting with First Nations Australians to make sure that we are developing all of our sectors across the whole of Australia in the best interests of all Australians. And Senator Cox, that includes Minister, First Nations. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Sazelja, who I note is freshly returned from a successful trip to Fiji. With Australia's border reopening as part of the government's national plan, can the minister update the Senate on how workers from the Pacific and Timor-Leste are contributing to Australia's rural economy, helping to secure jobs and supporting economic growth both in Australia and across our region as we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for International Development in the Pacific, Senator Sazelja. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Scar, who is a champion uh, of Australia's relations with the Pacific. Um, and I'm pleased to advise uh, that we have now almost 19,000 Pacific and Timorese workers in Australia, the most ever. Uh, since our Pacific Labor initiatives recommenced in September last year, more than, more than 14,000 uh, Pacific workers have arrived from seven participating Pacific nations and Timor-Leste. Between now and Christmas, a further 2,000 Pacific workers will arrive to assist with the harvest period, and a further 55,000 Pacific workers are ready and waiting to come to Australia. Now, this is immediate action to address critical workforce shortages across regional Australia. Pacific labour mobility is also expanding and now involved in more sectors. Uh, Pacific workers are helping to bring in harvests, process meat, care for our elderly and staff, our hospitality venues as we look Order. to bounce back after COVID-19. The government recognises the outstanding job Pacific and Timorese workers have done in critical industries in Australia throughout the pandemic particularly in agriculture. These workers have played a vital role in many rural industries, including Samoan aged care workers in Catherine in the Northern Territory, Fijian meat workers in Inverell in New South Wales, Solomon Islands horticultural workers in Clifton in Senator Scar's home state of Queensland. On average, a longer term Pacific worker will send remittances of more than $40,000 home over a three year placement. Uh, this is an economic stimulus that directly allows our workers to support family, educate their kids, build homes and serves as a life-changing economic investment in our region. This makes Pacific Labor much greater than just a win-win initiative within the region. It's essential for our Pacific family and we're committed to its future. Finally, as Christmas approaches, we should also take a moment to pause and express our gratitude to these Pacific workers who will be away from family and their communities at this important time of year. Minister, I thank our Pacific family Minister, for the invaluable the contribution they're making to Senator Scar, a second supplementary. Thank you, President. Can the minister update the Senate on the Liberal Sorry, and National's government's plans to improve and reform Australia's Pacific Labor Mobility Programs, further maximising the benefits to both businesses and workers? Sorry, and just to be clear, that was Senator Scar's first supplementary question. Senator, uh, Minister. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to the second as well. Today, we have announced the next stage of reforms to the Pacific Australia Labor Mobility Scheme. Uh, the changes follow extensive public consultation with Pacific Island countries and our domestic industries, which will see a consolidated, improved and more efficient Pacific Worker Scheme benefiting employers, workers and participating countries. From 4 April 2022, the Seasonal Worker Program and Pacific Labor Scheme will be consolidated and replaced by an improved PALM scheme, simplifying administration 
and reducing duplication. The new single palm scheme will be managed by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and its provider, the Pacific Labor Facility. We're also enhancing our commitment to skills and training as part of these reforms with more opportunities for palm workers to access job-specific training. These significant reforms will benefit employers, workers and participating nations, marking a new era of growth and success for Australia and the Pacific. Sorry, Senator Scar, I would never want to rob you of a question. A second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the recently announced reforms will help more Australian businesses hire more workers from the Pacific and Timor-Leste, while also protecting worker welfare and cutting red tape for employees? Minister. Uh, thank you. And the Palm Scheme will enable rural and regional businesses to engage the right workers more easily where and when they need them, alleviating critical workforce shortages. Visa arrangements will also be simplified with a single palm visa stream offering an extended length of stay of up to four years and the option to recruit workers for seasonal roles or longer term positions. We're also oh, no. introducing more flexibility for workers to move between employers in response to workforce demands, improving productivity and workers earning capacity. The palm scheme will further improve the high standards of program integrity and worker wellbeing that are central to the ongoing success of Pacific labour mobility. This is an exciting new era in Pacific labour mobility. These programs are win-win for Australia and our Pacific family. We look forward to welcoming more Pacific oh, workers God. to the invaluable contribution they make in Australia. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In early November, Mr Morrison leaked private text messages from French President Emmanuel Macron. Why did Mr Morrison leak private text messages from President Macron and betray the trust of an ally just to score a domestic political hit? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, I thank Senator Wong for the question. Uh, Mr President, uh, as uh, I'm sure everybody is aware uh, of the public commentary, news coverage and comments that had been made at the time in relation to uh, awareness uh, of discussions between Australia and France uh, on matters leading up to uh, the decision that was made by our government in the national interest to uh, cancel the contracts in relation to uh, the procurement of the attack class diesel powered submarines uh, in favour uh, of pursuing an alternate pathway through the new AUKUS strategic partnership with the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, providing for procurement uh, of uh, a future nuclear-powered submarine alternative. Uh, I think everyone, I'm sure, is aware, and especially Senator Wong, uh, that, uh, that there uh, were suggestions uh, that, uh, that at some level uh, France was uh, unaware of elements of Australia's concerns uh, about uh, the type of program. Uh, that, uh, that we would need and the type of capability that we would need uh, for the future. Uh, and, uh, and Senator Wong, uh, I, think, uh, I think you uh, would fully appreciate uh, that what the Prime Minister, when he landed in the UK, sought to do uh, was outlined very clearly in response to some of that public commentary uh, precisely uh, the type of engagements that had happened in the lead up to that announcement, the type of discussions that had been had uh, in relation uh, to ensuring, uh, to ensuring, to ensuring, Mr. President, uh, to ensuring, Mr. President, uh, that uh, the uh, the context in which all of those discussions were made was uh, was uh, better understood in the public discourse uh, surrounding that. Uh, we believe, Mr. President, these were important national security decisions that firmly are in the national interest. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Yesterday, Mr Morrison tried and failed to use private text messages I exchanged with the Leader of the Opposition to blame shift his way out of trouble. Why is Mr Morrison making a habit of revealing private text messages? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, I think those questions have been dealt with in terms of the previous questions that, uh, that I had and the question just, uh, just before, Mr President. I'd refer to those Order. answers. But, you know, you know, again, it comes back, comes back to those opposite wanting, as always, to Order. play the man. And we know they want to play the man because their advertising Order. briefs even show they want to play the man. Their advertising briefs even show it. You know, I was looking at their Order advertising brief for their TikTok campaign. And that said, Mr Minister. President— 
Minister, resume your seat. So, uh, Sen Senator Wong, sorry. The, so What's I have the point two of order? points of order. The first is direct relevance. It's not relevant what the, this minister thinks about what the opposition might or might not be doing. It is a question about Mr Morrison's behaviour. The second point of order, Mr President, goes to the leader's continued uh, refusal to ever address you and to always address the chamber. It is customary for us to address the chamber through the chair. Now, I, I agree that there are. That I, I agree. Are you going to let me finish? Senator, would you Senator like to Wong. speak? Senator Wong, order on my right. Senator Wong, you have the call, but please. Come I appreciate to a that, conclusion. Mr. President. Now, I accept all of us do address the chamber. This leader never turns to speak to you, and I would invite him to do so. Well, Senator Wong, you've had the opportunity to bring the minister. Senator Wong, Senator Wong, Senator Wong, you've had the opportunity on the. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. On the on the on the first point of order, you've had the opportunity to bring the minister's attention back to the question. I'm listening carefully to the minister. On the second point of order, I don't believe there is a point of order. Minister. So, Mr. Mr. President, Labor's TikTok advertising brief, and let me quote from it. It, it is quite. Minister. Please. How is this Minister possibly Senator relevant? Wong. Direct relevance. How is this possibly relevant to a question about Mr. Morrison's habit of revealing text messages? Please do not make I, question. Minister, please do not what, allow minister, question time to Senator so straight. I Senator haven't finished Wong. my point of order, Mr. President. I am asking you to not allow question time to so so depart from conventions and from the standing orders. Please pull this minister up. Senator Wong, I'm. Minister. Mr President, on the point of order, Senator Wong wants to interrupt as I'm midway through making a quote, a quote that she doesn't know where it finishes, or perhaps she's been looking a little more carefully at their advertising brief than I expected. But indeed, they want to ask questions that go to personal character assessments of the Prime Minister. Well, I think indeed activities that may well point to the fact that Labor have a plan, a tactic in this regard, uh, that their approach is all about personalisation, are indeed directly relevant. If they want to ask questions that are personal character attacks on the Prime Minister, then it is entirely, entirely appropriate to refute those. Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Wong, on the point of order, I am listening carefully to what the minister is saying. I will bring the minister back to the question. However, I do not know where the minister is going with a particular statement. I cannot know what's in the minister's mind. Minister, I'll bring you back to the question. You have the call. Oh, oh, Senator Wong, oh. I've just ruled. Saying something. Is, is, is this a point of order? Do Senator you want me Wong? to move dissent? Order on my right. The opposition will consider its position on your ruling, and I would ask to be very clear. I would ask you to be very clear after you hear the next part of the answer what your ruling is, so the opposition can consider its position on your ruling. Am I, uh, is that, am I, am I being crystal clear? Wong, you have made your point. Resume your seat. Order on my right. Order on my right. Order. I am listening carefully to the minister, as I always seek to do, uh, particularly when the chamber is not disorderly. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said in the opening sentence in response to this supplementary, in the opening sentence, where I referred the senator to the answer to the previous questions that were asked in relation to earlier text messages, where I referred the senator to my answer to the primary question, they directly addressed the question that was being asked. I was then seeking Mr President to go on, indeed, 
to address the broader theme that is underscores the Labor Party question. I appreciate Senator Wong is very sensitive about Minister, that broader theme, Minister, but it was very clear Minister, in the opening sentence Minister, what the answer was. The time for the answer has expired. Senator Wong, a second supplementary question. Are Mr Morrison's colleagues concerned he will leak their private text messages if it suits him? Minister. Thanks, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, you know, this is the pattern we have from the Labor Party in terms of it being all about the personalisation of conduct, the personalisation of the Prime Minister. No, we're not. So Senator Wong can't say that I might not answer the question. No, we're not to answer that part of the question. But Mr. President, Order Mr. President, you know, those opposite are clearly running Order a clear campaign. On my left. The quote I was giving before was the Labor Party creative brief. We want to create authentic and engaging content to create awareness on our overarching theme. What is it? Guess what their overarching theme was? Was it the Labor Party's values? No, it wasn't. Was it the Labor Party's policies? No, it wasn't. Minister. I to rule on whether that answer can possibly be directly relevant to my question. I ask for a clear ruling on that, Mr President. I, Senator Wong. Resume your seat. Senator Wong, I'm about to rule. Uh, you've had the opportunity to bring the minister back to the question. The minister did, de, the minister did allow me to rule, Senator Gallagher. Well, then don't interrupt, please. The minister directly addressed the question at the beginning of his answer. He is now uh, expanding. I am listening carefully to what he says. You have had the chance to bring him back to the question. Uh, Minister, I will order on my left. Minister, Senator Wong, uh, is this a different point of order? Uh, I'm asking you in relation to what I think is your ruling. Uh, to have the opportunity to take advice from the clerk, including the rulings by Senator Ryan, which indicated very clearly that the, uh, a directly relevant answer did not ground compliance with the standing orders of freewheeling thereafter. And I would ask, respectfully ask, Mr President, that you return to the chamber uh, with that ruling after you have the opportunity to take advice. Senator Wong, I will take advice and come back to the chamber tomorrow. Uh, however, I will say that I am. I continue to listen carefully to the minister's answer. Uh, minister, you have the call for 20 seconds remaining. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, to close it off and to bring it to the point of direct relevance to the overarching theme of Labor's question, what is Labor's overarching theme? Turns out, it's Scott Morrison. It's not anything to do with their policies or their values or their approach. They put it in writing in their own advertising brief that their overarching theme is only about Scott Morrison, not about anything they've got Order. to offer themselves. Minister, resume your seat. Senator Davey. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Regionalisation, Regional Communications and Regional Education, Senator Mackenzie. Can the minister please update the Senate on the investment that the Liberals and the Nationals in government are making to ensure regional and rural Australia has access and connection to 21st century telecommunications services? The minister. Order. Order. Senator Lambie. The order. The min the Minister for Regionalisation, Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And thank you, Senator Davey, for your tireless efforts in supporting rural and regional Australia, especially your constituents in New South Wales. Well, our government recognises the vital importance of digital connectivity to Australians who live, work and travel through rural, regional and remote Australia. They need access to good quality and reliable telecommunications. That's why we're delivering on our commitment to improve mobile coverage across Australia through our $380 million investment in the Mobile Black Spot program, which is providing more than 1,200 new mobile base stations in black spots right across Australia. 979 of those base stations have actually been activated and are right now, in real time, delivering real benefits to regional and rural communities right across Australia. 
including 320 funded base stations in your home state, Senator Davey. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk today about politics and partisanship, but how many base stations for rural and regional Australia has the Labor Party delivered? I don't know. You might be able to guess. This side of the chamber might be able to guess. Uh, if they had a policy on this, Order. the Labor Party might be able to tell us. I'll tell you. I'm, you know, zero. Zero. Uh, it's not even zero because you haven't been in government for that period of time. You actually don't have a policy to deliver mobile black spot coverage in this country. That is a fact. That is a fact. Whereas our side of politics has got $182 million, not just for our mobile black spot program, but our regional connectivity program, which provides place-based solutions for local communities out in the regions. And for Order. Senator Macdonald and Canavan uh, and Senator McMahon, we're also investing in connecting Northern Australia uh, through $685 million uh, dedicated to improving telecommunications in the north. We're about growing jobs and opportunities for the regions through connecting them with 21st century uh, digital connectivity. That's right. Senator Davey, supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline why quality telecommunications in regional Australia is vital to jobs and economic opportunity, as well as why it's so important in times of emergency? Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. Well, it absolutely is critical, and we've seen uh, through COVID the importance of that connectivity for people, young people in particular, to access education opportunities. Um, telehealth has been of significant importance during COVID, and to keep those supply chains open, uh, particularly with food supplies during uh, lockdowns uh, and border closures by state governments. Um, Reliable telecommunication services mean being able to use uh, those sort of services, as I've outlined, when and where you need them. We've seen a move of uh, Australians out of capital cities into the regions, and it is that digital connectivity that we've been able to deliver over the last eight years that has been, meant they've been able to stay out there. It's why Telstra has said, you know what, you don't have to come back to the CBD to uh, the office. You actually can stay where you're loving to live and stay our employee. We've uh, consulted widely across the regions through our regional telecommunications Minister, review Minister, and look forward to delivering a response shortly. Expired. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. And finally, is the minister aware of any risks to regional telecommunications services and what impact a lack of investment would have on our regional Australians and the communities they work and live in? Minister. I'm not aware of any alternatives. And as Senator Davey, as I said in my first answer, uh, nowhere in the Labor policy platform at the last election, nor in the ambiguity that they are talking to Australian people around the next election's policy, do they mention mobile black spot funding. Uh, big talk around the NBM, but nothing about place-based, localised solutions for rural and regional communities. Nothing about the Internet of Things on farm. Uh, nothing about how they can actually ensure that those that don't live in major regional capitals like Newcastle, uh, like Geelong, and like Ballarat and Bendigo, their two favourite regional capitals, that they are happy to invest in. But if you live outside of those two, Order. you get nothing. Nothing. No, no, absolutely nothing. So the greatest risk to, to connecting the regions, to growing the regions through digital connectivity, is electing Albanese and his best mates, uh, the Greens and Adam Minister. Band. Senator Lambie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the minister representing the Minister for Defence. Minister, minister, lawyers are taking the Australian Defence Force to court on behalf of a young former recruit. They are alleging that on October 1, 2020, the former RAF aircraft man was bound, gagged and strangled by fellow recruits in a video that appears to be of the events. The recruit is sexually assaulted. Minister, this is torture. This seems to be becoming standard behaviour of Defence Force. It's the torture of an Australian who signed up to serve his country. When did Minister Dutton become aware of these allegations? The Minister representing the Minister for Defence, Minister Senator Payne. Thank you very much, and uh, I thank Senator Lambie for, for her question, of which I have no notice, and I am not aware of the um, uh, matters to which Senator Lambie refers. 
If the matters to which Senator Lambie refers the beginning of her question are matters of fact, and if they are correct, as she has described them to the chamber, then in any circumstances they would be completely unacceptable actions uh, in any context, uh, not just the context in which Senator Lambie has raised it. However, Senator Lambie has gone on in her question to assert that these matters are, and I think I stand to be corrected by the Hansard, but these matters are standard behaviour or routine, uh, some variation of those words uh, in her remarks. I absolutely reject that. I absolutely reject that. These are not appropriate behaviours. They are not supported in any context in the Australian Defence Force. They are not standard behaviour. And I will follow these matters up, Senator Lambie, and come back to the chamber with further information. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question? That would be wonderful. And when the Royal Commission goes through, I'll come back to what you just said, because that is all going to come out. Defence investigated the recruits' complaints of abuse last year, and nothing happened. Nothing happened. What kind of investigation was held here? At what rank was it held? And who did the investigation? That's what I want to know. Minister. Given that I've already advised the chamber that I am not aware of these matters, I have no further information for Senator Lambie. I'll take those questions on notice and return to the chamber. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary question. Defence have been offered to see the video and have declined to use it as part of evidence. They might be going. They might be. Go, they might be going back on that now. They say they are completely unaware of this ever occurring, and when given the chance to see it, themse see it themselves, say no. There have been dozens of complaints about the toxic culture that seeped into this one base. Why hasn't Defence done anything about these allegations? Minister, Senator, Lamp, as I've said, order, order, Senator Lambie. As I said in relation to Senator Lambie's first and second questions, I'm not aware of this matter. I don't have any information for the senator, but I have indicated that I will take questions on notice and return with information to her. Senator Grogan. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Mr Morrison declared to the parliament in relation to former Australia Post Chief Executive Christine Holgate that she can go but later claimed that Ms Holgate chose to resign of her own accord. Why did he say that when it wasn't true? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks Mr President. I thank, uh, thank Senator Grogan uh, for the question. Uh, I would, uh, would refer Senator Grogan to uh, the published statements uh, from Australia Post uh, at the time in relation to Ms Holgate's resignation. Uh, Senator Grogan, a supplementary question. Mr Morrison previously said that reports that he had tried to invite Brian Houston to the White House were gossip. Why did the Prime Minister say that when it was not true? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, I believe the Prime Minister has uh, addressed that question in the House of Representatives this question time, and I refer to the hands up. Senator Grogan, a second supplementary question. Does Mr Morrison still stand by his statement that he has never told a lie in public life? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, well, indeed, I'm sure he does, Mr President. And you know what? I'm not going to stand here uh, and be lectured on integrity by the hypocrites opposite, Mr President. I'm not going to be lectured on integrity for those who invented the Medicare campaign and decided that that was the way they were going to try to somehow win office by scaring Australians on false policies. I'm not going to be lectured by those opposite who are currently running the pensioner scare campaign, again trying to sneak into office on a falsehood. And I invite any one of them to stand up and apologise to Australian pensioners who right now they're erroneously trying to scare into believing policies that simply do not exist that Senator Rustin has refuted time Order. and time and time again. Those opposite who come into this chamber and love endlessly, Order of course, to want to talk left. about you know, car park programs, when of course they invented the car park programs themselves and were happily touring Order the country announcing them themselves, left. or those opposite with their tick-tock dirty tricks that they're trying to run against the Prime Minister. That's the hypocrisy Minister. on show from those Minister. opposite. The time has expired. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister advise the Senate on the ways in which Australia is protecting and securing our national interests in a challenging world? 
the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you, and I thank Senator Patterson uh, very much for his question, and particularly for his interest in these key issues. Because it is the case that the Morrison government is delivering clear outcomes in Australia's interests in the Indo-Pacific, in our bilateral engagement and in our multilateral engagement. As I noted in the Senate yesterday, we're the first country to secure a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN and have formed CSPs with both India and Malaysia in the last two years alone, as well as our comprehensive strategic and economic partnership with Papua New Guinea, all key regional relationships. We've also seen remarkable progress on the Quad over the past two years, from just the first ministerial in-person meeting in 2019 to realising the historic in-person Quad Leaders Summit in September of this year. We've advanced our cooperation with Quad partners to make the region stronger, more prosperous, more stable through delivering practical outcomes together with the United States, with Japan and with India. To enhance our national security for decades to come, we have entered a partnership with the United Kingdom and the United States to share technology, including cyber, quantum and artificial intelligence, as well as nuclear propulsion systems for a new fleet of submarines. This is a landmark agreement. Only once before has a country agreed to share such nuclear-powered submarine technology with another nation, and that was the United States with the United Kingdom in the 1950s, over six decades ago. These outcomes, bilateral and others, are significant steps in our long-standing partnerships, but also cognizant of the changing strategic environment, befitting of the depth and of our shared interests in the security and prosperity of our region and in the interests of the Australian people. Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Will the Minister update the Senate on the importance and role of international engagement and partnerships in addressing the COVID-19 pandemic? Minister. I thank Senator Patterson for his supplementary question, because the crucial word in our cooperation on the pandemic is partnership, yeah. based on the needs and the priorities of our partners. Our vaccine partnerships in the Indo-Pacific are not just about the sharing of vaccine doses, but about training for health workers, cold chain equipment provision, public information campaign support and technical advice so that vaccines reach the arms of the people who do need them the most. And it was thanks to our strong relationships with Poland, with the United Kingdom, with Singapore and the European Union that the government was able to secure 6.5 million vaccine doses to also secure our to strengthen our domestic rollout. We're partnering with our neighbours' health systems as well, through Australian medical assistance teams and the supply of equipment such as oxygen concentrators, logistics and testing and surveillance, through groups such as the Quad, ASEAN, the Pacific Islands Forum, we're aligning our responses and coordinating with multilateral initiatives such as the COVAX facility Minister, in vaccine delivery. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Patterson, a second supplementary question. Thank you. Will the minister advise how Australia is working to cement Australia's and our region's economic recovery from the pandemic? Minister. Patterson for his uh, <coughs> second supplementary question, because the government is focused on supporting a regional economic recovery that's underpinned by free and open markets, governed by transparent rules. We know that jobs and investment in Australia's economy are linked with those of our region. Australia's Pacific Step Up has expanded and deepened our partnerships in the region, maintaining a record $1.44 billion assistance, development assistance to the Pacific in 2021-22. On 2 November, Australia ratified the RCEP, the world's largest free trade agreement, which will bring together nine of Australia's top 15 trading partners into a single economic framework. Following the signing of our Australia-India CSP in 2020, we've now formally resumed negotiations on a comprehensive economic cooperation agreement with India, deepening bilateral trade with one of our most important Indo-Pacific partners. Under this government, Australia is seen as a reliable, consistent and trusted partner, and our commitment to free and open trade is absolute. Minister. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Uh, Senator, two days of question time in a row, and already the Prime Minister has been caught out again today, not telling the truth in the parliament. This is very reminiscent of what happened when the Prime Minister went to Glasgow for COP26. 
26. On the back of being called out by the French President Macron, the Prime Minister's word was mud. Business leaders, community leaders, delegates, negotiators all knew they couldn't trust what the Prime Minister would say. After signing the Glasgow Pact, which requires Australia to make changes to keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees, including phasing down coal, the Prime Minister came back to Australia and said he didn't need to change a thing. Is the Prime Minister fibbing to the world, to our children or to himself? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I uh, thank Senator Hanson Young for that question, Mr. President. I thank Senator Young for the question because, indeed, the Prime Minister did go to Glasgow, and he went to Glasgow armed with the facts of Australia's record on climate change. Yeah. And Australia's record on climate change is one of absolutely delivering what we promise. Indeed, of over-delivering on our promises is our record when it comes to climate change, Mr. President. Australia has seen our emissions fall by more than 20 per cent since 2005. They're down 5.3 per cent this year, Mr President. We beat our Kyoto-era targets by 459 million tonnes, Mr President. So the Prime Minister was able to travel to Glasgow with a track record of Australia's track record of delivery by the Australian people, of Australian farmers, of Australian businesses, of Australians who have invested themselves and have seen their governments invest and have seen many businesses invest in achieving the change to reduce emissions. He was able to go to Glasgow with a track record in excess of that of many other nations, nations who the Greens sometimes seem to love to lord, whereas Australia indeed is exceeding them in terms of achievement when it comes to reducing emissions. Emissions reduction in our country faster than Canada, faster than Japan, faster than New Zealand, faster than the United States or the G20 or OECD averages. That is the track record that we were able to take to Glasgow, the Australian track record, as the Prime Minister promoted the Australian way of reducing those emissions, the Australian way of investing in emissions reduction through technology, through innovation, through backing people to be able to get ahead and in getting ahead by reducing those emissions successfully without destroying jobs, elements of our economy or undermining Australia's competitiveness. That's the positive story. The Prime Minister was able to take to Glasgow. Uh, it is one of achievement, overachievement, and Minister, of clear plans for the future. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Prime Minister's word was mud in Glasgow, and everyone knows it. Everyone knows it. We had an Australian pavilion that was whitewashed and greenwashed, covered in logos from Santos, not even a skerrick of representation from our First Nations people. Why is the Prime Minister denying not just the climate science and the fast track we need, but also denying First Nations people a right to have a voice in relation to this issue? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I suspect Senator Hanson Young was talking to a rather select group of individuals when she was in Glasgow. That's my suspicion. And that the group Senator Hanson Young was hanging out with probably had some uh, predetermined prejudices in their thinking. Apparently, even a prejudice against uh, uh, a fine, significant South Australian company like Santos that Senator Hanson Young chose to sledge on the way through in her question. Uh, Mr. President, what Australia oh, highlighted uh... was not just our overachievement in terms of emissions reductions, but our commitments and plans for the future. The commitment to work towards net zero by 2050 and to achieve that underpinned by investment of more than $21 billion from government in low emissions technologies over the decade to 2030, helping to secure more than $80 billion in total investment by leveraging other private sector capital and investment that is going to help to achieve the type of emissions reductions through technological breakthroughs that have got us so far in achieving more than 20 per cent reductions to date Minister, and will help to achieve Minister, the further challenges we face. Your time has expired. Senator Hanson Young, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The Prime, Minister, the Prime Minister's performance at Glasgow was embarrassing. We've now got back to Australia, and again the Prime Minister can't be trusted on anything he says. He lied. He's misled. He has absolutely denied the truth in relation to. Senator Abetz on a point of order. Oh, order. Oh, 
Order. Uh, Mr. Senator, President, Senator Betts, the, uh, point of order. Yes, uh, the reflection on the Prime Minister is clearly against standing orders and it needs to be withdrawn unequivocally. Senator Hanson Young, uh, Senator Wong, on the point of order. Uh, Mr. President, uh, you, and you may wish to go away and consider this as well, but I do note earlier today that Senator Rustin used the words lying liar lies on multiple occasions in the contribution on the suspension debate um, and accused uh, everyone on this side knowing that they were lying, made a number of allegations about lying. It may be uh, uh, that obviously we didn't take uh, no, we did. We didn't. We didn't take offence, and, uh, and you know. But uh, order, but order. I, I would ask you to just reflect on whether or not, the, given that the manager of the government has been prepared to do so, whether it's appropriate at this stage to rule this out. There, Senator Wong, I'm I'm, I'm prepared. I'm I, I'm order in the chamber. There there. There is, there has been a clear Senator Wong, Senator Rustin. There has been a clear um, precedent and number of rulings that say that um, a, an epithet like lying directed at an individual is clearly in breach of 1933, whereas such a comment directed in general at a political party is not out of order. In the case of this question, Senator Hanson Young, your, uh, your accusation was directed directly at the Prime Minister, so I will ask you to withdraw that part. I think the rest of the question can stand. You have 11 seconds remaining. I would ask you to withdraw and then continue your question. Thank you, Mr President. I withdraw. Minister, why does the Prime Minister have a problem with truth? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, uh, Senator Hanson Young, in, uh, in her reference to those international engagements that occurred at Glasgow, uh, obviously overlooked the fact that the Prime Minister, in those international engagements uh, with Australian ministers and our government, has signed new low technology emissions partnerships with Singapore, with Japan, with Germany, with the UK, with Korea, with Indonesia, with Vietnam. Demonstrating, Mr. President, Order. demonstrating, Mr. President, indeed, just Order. how closely the Prime Minister and our government are working with international partners, completely contrary to the type of claims that the Greens want to make. Completely contrary to the type of claims the Greens want to make. Those close international partnerships on technology cooperation uh, that uh, are a vote of confidence in terms of the investment we're making in that technology the work and commitment we have to emissions reduction and Australia's track record on achievement, which our government is proud of and continues to pursue and deliver. Minister, Senator Ayres. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Does the Prime Minister believe that an unvaccinated person in Sydney should be able to get a cup of coffee at a cafe today? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, the Prime Minister you know, does believe that as we implement the national plan towards reopening, uh, which the Prime Minister took to the national cabinet uh, and worked with the states and territories to get them to make commitments consistent with that national plan, and as we achieve some of the highest levels of vaccination in the developed world. More than 91 per cent of Australians have now had a first dose. More than 85 per cent have now had a second dose. Uh, that we need to work through the different stages of that national plan, Mr. President. And the different stages of that national plan do chart a course towards normality. Normality as it was before COVID. Yes, knowing that, of course, vaccination and different health protocols will require us to continue to manage and work with COVID. The Prime Minister, I and all members of the government urge every single Australian to go and get vaccinated. That is what everybody should do. But we want to make sure as well that in terms of the cafe owners, the small business owners, the staff working in retail across the country, that all of those individuals are respected in terms of 
uh, the engagement that they will have going forward, working, living, operating businesses in one of the most heavily vaccinated countries in the world. Uh, and that means that they should be free to operate in accordance with the laws of the land, but they also should be free in terms of not having undue, longer term, more onerous than is necessary restrictions placed upon them in terms of how they enforce operations in their business or what they do in their businesses. That indeed is why the National Plan charted those different stages and as we get the highest possible levels of vaccination in this country, we should be looking to move into those final stages. We should be looking Order. to the pathway into those final stages. That of course is the case here in the ACT, one of the most highly vaccinated jurisdictions Order in the world. And I've got no doubt that is the case we're seeing in terms of where Minister, New South Wales and other states will Minister, head. thank you. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. Well, as opposed to today, in September, Mr Morrison said, and I quote, let's be clear about what the plan says. When you get to 80 per cent, domestic restrictions on vaccinated persons should be lifted. We're not talking about willy-nilly movement of people who are unvaccinated. But now, he says, restrictions should be lifted at 80 per cent for unvaccinated people to get a cup of coffee at a cafe in Brisbane. Time. Was he lying Senator in September Ayers. or is he lying now? Senator Ayres, resume your seat. Minister, insofar as the question was asked. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. Well, obviously this was a supplementary, so I assume the question draws on from the primary question, which was in relation to New South Wales. And I note, Mr President, that New South Wales is not at 80 per cent vaccination. New South Wales is at 92 per cent double dose vaccination, Mr President. 94.4 per cent first dose vaccination, Order, Mr lab. President. So New South Wales indeed has well and truly exceeded that 80 per cent target in relation to the national plan. That is why we welcome the fact that the New South Wales government has been able to make further commitments in terms of reopening, further commitments that have enabled us as a Commonwealth government to make additional steps and commitments in terms of reopening, including our international borders, with the announcements made this week in relation to enabling visa holders to return to Australia. Those steps in the national plan are possible because of the very high vaccination rates that have been achieved. Vaccination rates in excess of what Senator Ayres quoted then, Minister, well in excess of Minister, them. your time has expired. Senator Ayres, a second supplementary. Mr Morrison's criticised the Queensland government for its restrictions on vaccinated people, but backs in restrictions on unvaccinated people in New South Wales. Why has the Prime Minister got one position in Queensland and another position in New South Wales? Minister. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Well, I think, Mr. President, uh, if, uh, if the Senator cared to actually look at what Premier Perrottet has announced in terms of the different steps in relation to New South Wales, uh, there are uh, indeed further steps in terms of New South Wales is opening up uh, that are being pursued and are being undertaken, uh, Mr. President. Uh, that is New South Wales operating in accordance with the scientific evidence of the national plan. And this is just it, Order. Mr. President. This is just it. Senator Our McAllister. government at every stage has sought to provide leadership in closing the international borders, Order leadership in sharing the health left. advice, leadership in terms of Senator mandating Keneally. vaccines where they're necessary for the highly vulnerable in aged care, in disability care, in high care health settings. We've recognised all of Senator that, McAllister. but also the leadership in terms of developing a scientifically underpinned national plan for reopening, something very few countries in the world had the opportunity to be able to do, Mr President. We have, Order. we did, we are now seeing it implemented, and that is to the great benefit Minister, of the Australian people. Mr President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Sen uh, Minister, Minister Payne, you're oh, Thank you, the Mr call? President. I wish to provide further information to the chamber in response to Senator Lambie's question. Uh, Mr President, the ABC published a story this morning detailing uh, the bastardisation to which I believe Senator Lambie refers. Uh, Defence was made aware of the existence of the video to which I believe Senator Lambie refers on the 27th, 22nd of October and immediately urged the individual's lawyers, Operational Legal Australia, to refer the matter to the civilian authorities. Defence has now also referred the matter to the Joint Military Police Unit for review. Defence has not seen the footage nor been provided a copy of the video. Defence is working to identify those who were pictured in this morning's ABC report. 
and Mr. President, it is not appropriate for me to comment further on individual matters, uh, as I'm sure the Chamber would appreciate. Uh, let me reiterate the observations I made in relation to Senator Lambie's first question. The Australian Defence Force is well known and highly respected around the world for its exemplary standards and its insistence on them. And I thank those members of the ADF, the many, many women and men of the ADF, for their past and ongoing service to our country. A, unite, a unifying set of defence values and behaviour sets the benchmark for what defence expects of its people in the workplace. All defence personnel are expected to behave in accordance with the defence values and behaviours. Defence does not tolerate unacceptable behaviour and takes action when unacceptable behaviour occurs in accordance with the department's unacceptable behaviour policy. A soldier service has recently been terminated as a result of sending inappropriate images to his colleagues. Importantly, these instances are few. The vast majority of our personnel are a credit to the Australian Defence Force and to the nation. Defence has extensive awareness programs and support services in place to educate and assist all personnel. This includes trainee officers and ADF cadets. Our government is very proud of our Defence Force. Our ADF has been responsive and able and available to assist our Australian communities through some of the most difficult times this year and last year. They have been here for us through support and recovery through bushfires and floods. They have protected our communities as we deal with COVID-19 impacts, and we thank them for their service. Thank you, Minister. Senator Farrell, on this matter, because otherwise I have a matter I wish to update the Chamber on. No, not this matter. Uh... Uh, I just wish to update the Chamber on the uh, AFP MOU, uh, MOU and national guidelines. Uh, the Speaker, the Attorney General, the Minister for Home Affairs and I have signed a new memorandum of understanding regarding AFP investigations where parliamentary privilege may be involved. The Australian Federal Police will also issue a new national guideline which updates the procedures that the AFP will follow for the collection and quarantining of material that could be subject to parliamentary privilege. The MOU and guideline are designed to ensure that law enforcement investigations are conducted without improperly interfering with the functioning of parliament, its committees and its members. They also ensure that parliamentarians and their staff are given a proper opportunity to raise claims of parliamentary privilege in relation to material that is obtained through the execution of a warrant. The new MOU and guideline replace the 2005 settlement of these issues and includes some, some significant improvements, uh, particularly related to overall improved oversight of investigations which may intersect with parliamentary privilege, clarifying the application of the guideline to electronic information, particularly where this is held by third parties, and reporting to the Committee of Privilege on the use of covert powers in relation to parliamentarians and their staff. These changes address shortcomings in the 2005 protocols, which were identified in reports of the Privileges Committee in both houses tabled during the 45th Parliament. They also respond to the Senate resolution of December 2018, which called on the Attorney-General to work with the presiding officers to develop a new protocol for the execution of search warrants and the use of other intrusive powers by executive agencies. It was initially hoped new procedures would also be agreed in relation to the exercise of covert powers. However, more work is required to ensure these procedures address the concerns of parliamentarians, particularly in relation to access and use of telecommunications data and the quarantining of material collected covertly. In addition, there are practical issues which the AFP must address to ensure that the agreed procedures do not unduly hamper investigations. Further negotiations regarding the implementation of procedures that ensure covert powers are exercised in a manner, in a manner which does not intrude on parliamentary privilege will be conducted in the next parliament. I would like to acknowledge the work of the Speaker, Minister Andrews, the Attorney-General and particularly Senators Abetz and McAllister uh, and members of the Committee of Privileges, including the Chair of the Privileges Committee, Senator O'Neill. Uh, in particular, though, I wish to pay tribute to President, former President Ryan uh, for his clarity of thought and perseverance in this matter. He would have very much liked to have had this concluded before his departure. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case, 
but I know that he is pleased that it has been concluded. Now, I table a copy of the MOU and the National Guideline. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for two minutes. That's fine. Thank you. Leave is granted. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank the Senate. Uh, Mr President, I just wish to, uh, to make a short statement to acknowledge uh, the tabling of the memorandum of understanding uh, that, uh, that you have just undertaken, the statement that you have just made, Mr President, in relation to the memorandum of understanding on the execution of search warrants in relation to a member of parliament, uh, and of course, Mr President, uh, to acknowledge in particular uh, the extensive work that has been undertaken in relation to this matter. I do so acknowledging that it is work that has transcended uh, presiding officers, uh, relevant ministers uh, and a number of officials and others involved in the process and therefore that, uh, that we extend that acknowledgement to all those who have uh, engaged in this process in good faith, uh, seeking to resolve uh, what are at times challenging issues of principle uh, in relation to the protection of privilege, uh, but also ensuring uh, that, uh, that in no way uh, is the proper uh, engagement of our law enforcement officials uh, impeded unnecessarily uh, in relation to the upholding uh, of the laws of the land. Uh, I particularly acknowledge the work uh, that, uh, that uh, the Privileges Committee uh, has undertaken in helping to inform and advise uh, presiding officers uh, and all parties uh, to this work. Uh, and, uh, and trust Mr President that uh, the safeguards that have been built uh, into the memorandum of understanding, uh, including in relation uh, to the reporting arrangements that exist, uh, will help to provide all parliamentarians uh, with the confidence uh, that they can conduct uh, their duties uh, in the manner in which uh, uh, all parliamentarians should be free to do so, uh, in accordance with the historic conventions and traditions that have enabled uh, robust assessment and analysis by parliamentarians uh, of issues and prosecution of those issues uh, with the necessary freedoms and protections to do so, uh, but that also uh, these measures should give confidence uh, to all Australians that whilst our parliamentary democracy is protected, uh, so too uh, will appropriate uh, action be available in relation uh, to legal matters uh, and that, uh, that, as always, no Australian sits uh, completely above the law in our nation. Uh, Mr President, I thank you uh, for the statement that you have made to the Senate and the details that you have outlined to the Senate uh, and for, uh, for bringing this matter here and again acknowledge the cross-party and especially bipartisan way uh, in which these matters have been tackled. Senator Wong. Mr President, I seek leave to make a short statement. There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. Um, these are fundamentally important documents that have been tabled today which go to the heart of the relationship between Parliament and the executive. And I note that they replace an MOU and guideline agreed to in 2005. And since that time, but especially in the last five years, the Senate has dealt with multiple incursions into the privileges of its committees and of senators, which have been the subject of a number of reports by the Standing Committee of Privileges. In particular, during the 2016 election campaign, the Turnbull government launched a raid on the officers of the then Deputy Leader of the Opposition in the Senate, Senate Senator Conroy, and the private home of a member of his staff. Extraordinary action which came about because Senator Conroy had information about the national broadband network that was politically embarrassing for the government of the day. The Privileges Committee recommended and the Senate adopted without dissent not only a finding that the claim of privilege by Senator Conroy be upheld, but also that the documents be withheld from the Australian Federal Police investigation and returned to Senator Conroy. This was a political action in the mi middle of an election campaign which was conducted with disregard of parliamentary privilege, as was evidenced by the further finding by the Privileges Committee in its 164th report that improper interference occurred with the functions of the parliament and the free performance by Senator Conroy of his duties as a senator. The necessity of a robust memorandum and guideline is demonstrated by these events. In December 2018, the Senate first agreed to a motion calling for the development of a new protocol for the execution of search warrants and the use by executive agencies of other intrusive powers complying with the principles and addresses the shortcomings identified in the reports tabled by the Bipartisan Privileges Committee. 
the intent of these documents is to ensure that Parliament and parliamentarians are not subject to inter improper interference in the performance of their duties. And they are intended to facilitate investigations in a way that does not amount to a contempt of Parliament and provide parliamentarians with a measure of confidence that parliamentary privilege is being respected and that parliamentarians will have an opportunity to make claim that material is protected by privilege. While the MOU and guideline are intended to operate as a safeguard against the possibility of contempt by providing for the rights of members of parliaments to be protected, it is important to note that their existence alone cannot preclude the possibility of contempt being committed. It is a reminder to the executive that privilege, parliamentary privilege is not a convention or a courtesy, it is the law. Mr President, I agree with you that these documents represent significant progress. I also agree with you that there is unfinished business. As the President has said, it was not possible to conclude negotiations on the operation of the memorandum and guideline with respect to the exercise of covert powers. I note the agreement explicitly refers to the further negotiation in relation to these powers in the next parliament, and regardless of who forms government after the next election, this agreement must be honoured. And I urge those senators across the chamber, including those opposite, uh, to really turn their minds uh, to the importance of making sure that privilege is uh, respected in terms of the interactions between uh, the executive and the parliament. It cannot be another 16 years before these documents are further reviewed and updated. I place on record my thanks, uh, personal thanks to Senator McAllister for her leadership and work on behalf of the opposition in negotiations on these matters. Renegotiation is something that we have been seeking for some years. I also uh, place on record my thanks to former President Ryan for his extensive work uh, in finalising these documents. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham. Uh, sorry, to the sorry, Senator Farrell, do you mind just resuming your seat? Sen Senator Patrick was actually seeking the call as well on another matter. Yes, and, and, and I might add it, uh, it's supported by the standing orders uh, uh, 70, uh, yes. 75. 5. Um, so, pursuant to that standing order, I would like to seek an explanation from the uh, minister representing the Prime Minister as to why question number 4085, which has been on the notice paper since the 6th of September, has not been answered. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Uh, in relation to uh, what I think was question 4085, Five that, uh, that Senator Patrick indicated, uh, dating back to the 6th of September. Um, I shall uh, shall uh, look into uh, look into those matters for the senator. Senator Patrick. Yes, I'd uh, rise to take note of that uh, response from the minister. Uh, look, this is an important question, uh, uh, minister, and it shouldn't have been a difficult one to answer. So I'll just read the question for you. Uh, since the decision in Patrick and Secretary, Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in brackets Freedom of Information AAT 2719 was handed down on the 5th of August, how many Freedom of Information requests has the Department received relating to National Cabinet documents? Now, I would have thought that would be a pretty simple answer to get uh, access to. and It actually is uh, disturbing that uh, of the four questions that are outstanding in relation to uh, the notice paper, three of them are from the Prime Minister's office, almost uh, treating the, this place in contempt by uh, you know, just not answering questions in a timely fashion. I want to I go to why this question is important. And it relates to a response that a constituent of mine received uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, and indeed uh, uh, a response that I received uh, a, a week ago from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet in relation to an FOI request that I made. Uh, both of the requests my constituent and myself were in similar terms. I'll read what my request was. I requested the agendas, minutes and records of decisions of the initial 10 Cabinet uh, meetings, excluding documents that were already released including the full minutes of the cabinet, uh, National Cabinet dated uh, 15 March 2020. So I was after National Cabinet uh, uh, minutes, 
Now, in response to that, I was going to read from the decision which was made by uh, Miss Angie McKenzie, and I think it's a disgraceful decision. It's a disgraceful decision that uh, really does uh, warrant some consideration by the government uh, because it seeks to override uh, Justice White's decision, and I'll explain how it does that. Um, uh, Miss uh, McKenzie uh, puts in her decision reasoning uh, to re in, in her refusing to give grant access to, to these documents the fact that, uh, and I'll read from the decision, I am aware and have considered the Administrative Appeals Tribunal decision delivered on the 5th of August 2021 by Deputy President, President in brackets Justice White in Patrick and Secretary Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet 2021 AAT 2719. Justice White was of the view that on the evidence available to him, National Cabinet was not a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act. Now, I just want to now read to you how this uh, officer inside the PMC uh, has now made a determination. She writes, in view of all the evidence available to me, not, of all, not all of which was available to the AAT in, in making its decision in Patrick, and as set out below, I have formed the view that National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet for the purposes of the FOI Act, and therefore National Cabinet documents are exempt from disclosure under section 34 of the FOI Act. To summarise what is being said here, Justice White says, uh, and says quite explicitly in his uh, judgment, he says, uh, uh, I find persuasively against the National Cabinet being a committee of the Cabinet within the meaning of the statutory expression. So that's what judges do. They look at the statutory ex expressions and they try and interpret what, uh, what the meaning of them are. So there's no doubt as to what Justice White was saying. National Cabinet is not a committee of the Federal Cabinet. That was his decision, wasn't appealed, and then we find uh, some short time later we've got some low-level official, uh, an acting secretary, um, which I'll get the uh, I get this right, assistant secretary, cabinet division, saying, "Don't worry about what, what Justice White says. She's found that it is." And I just can't reconcile that. I just cannot reconcile that now. What she did was she said, no, I've got some new evidence that Justice White didn't have. And uh, uh, she says, on the 15th of March, the National Cabinet endorsed the terms of reference for National Cabinet, which explicitly provide that National Cabinet was established as a committee of the Cabinet, and among other things, goes on to talk about its proceedings and so forth. She suggests, she's basically saying, that's new evidence that Justice White didn't have. Well, let me just read from Justice White's, uh, um, from his uh, judgment at para uh, 189. He, he said, the respondents, who, and that's talking about PMC, who had the relevant onus, did not adduce formal evidence of adoption of the members of the National Cabinet of principles of collective responsibility and solidarity. I am willing to accept, however, that by the adoption of the terms of reference attached to the minutes of National Cabinet, it did resolve to act in accordance with such principles. So you've got an FOI officer who says, the judge didn't see the terms of reference, yet in his judgment he references them. He references and acknowledges them. So this is an incompetence of, a, of a, a, an order that I haven't seen before. The, the decision actually mentions the evidence that this official says uh, was not available to, uh, to Justice White. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms McKenzie then goes on to suggest that uh, the, uh, the other piece of evidence that uh, uh, Justice White didn't have was a statement by the Prime Minister, Premiers uh, and Chief Ministers that they expect this to be confidential, as though a statement by a Prime Minister or a statement by a Premier that something ought to be confidential makes it law. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't. You can't have a Prime Minister saying, uh, this is my view and that is law. That's not how it works. For it to be law, it has to pass through both chambers in this building. Not just be a statement. It doesn't matter whether it's this, uh, the Prime Minister or a Premier. 
So this, this uh, Miss um, Angie McKenzie clearly has no idea of how the law works even. It's a disgrace that this sort of uh, material comes out of Prime Minister and Cabinet, an organisation that's supposed to be the preeminent department in the Commonwealth. I actually think uh, Ms McKenzie has breached her obligations under the Public Service Act. What's happened is she has uh, not just trimmed her political sails, she's actually just put up a Liberal Party uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, spinnaker to make this decision. I, I see Senator Dunningham uh, shaking his head at me. How do you get a situation, Senator, how do you get a situation where a judge says, a, a judge says that is yeah, I'm having a go at a public servant because this public servant is incompetent. It's incompetent. And public servants ought to know that if they do something as stupid as what she has done, I'm going to call it out. And I'm going to do that over and over again. I respect public servants, but not when they are politicised like this. Justice White made the point, made, the, made a determination that National Cabinet was not a committee of the Federal Cabinet. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to, to work out that and that is not appropriate for a public servant to say, disregard what the judge says. That's not okay. And, if, and, and the problem we've got, and this goes to the reason why this, this question ought to be, have, have been answered, is because the number is somewhere above 50. 50 applications have been made to PMC for access to National Cabinet documents since the decision uh, that was handed down by Justice White. And that's likely to be 55 decisions wrongly made by PMC that goes off to the Information Commissioner and clogs up the entire system. And that may well suit uh, those on the other side of the chamber who simply uh, love secrecy. They don't want to have anything disclosed to the public. Well, the news is that everything that the government does is paid for by the public and is supposed to be for the benefit of the public, and they are entitled to see it, except in very narrow circumstances. And this is just an abuse. So, yes, Senator, I'm going to name a public official, particularly one that has uh, behaved in such an abhorrent way. Well, you want to, if you want to fire me up, you're welcome to, because this is just wrong. This is just wrong. And you ought to be standing up and actually agreeing with me that we respect what our judicial officers say. Now, of course, the government says, oh, well, the AAT, uh, you know, it's not binding upon the executive. Let's look at who was involved in this. OK, the matter went to the Information Commissioner. She bumped it up the chain, said this is an important matter. It needs to be sorted out by the AAT. Gets to the AAT, and the AAT recognises its importance and assigns a judicial officer as the presiding member. And it wasn't as though uh, even uh, Bush lawyer Rex Patrick argued the case. It was, it was uh, Geoffrey Watson SC, a most eminent barrister with a, with a, a long history, uh, a gentleman and someone who knows the law inside out. And on the other side was, uh, was Mr Berger QC from, from, from PM&C. This is one, it was on a kangaroo court. Serious legal minds dealing with this issue. Overturned by someone in PM&C who is a public official uh, who ought to absolutely respect the way the rule of law works in this country. Absolutely should be respecting exactly what uh, uh, the, the authority of a justice in terms of making statutory interpretation. So yes, I am naming Miss Angie McKenzie. I'm naming her as incompetent and I'm naming her as politicised. She's been directed to make a decision contrary to law because it suits the Prime Minister. Because the Prime Minister doesn't want anyone to know about anything that happens in the National Cabinet, doesn't want to know about all of the decisions made about the NCCC or what the AHPPC might have been saying about masks or, or, or protecting children or vaccinations. 
all things that we ought to be able to see. The National Cabinet is a meeting of uh, the federal government and the states. It's an inter intergovernmental uh, uh, meeting. Now, the FOI actually protects those sorts of meetings. It just doesn't give a blanket pr uh, uh, protection. It's, it's not controversial. I'm not saying open the floodgates, and neither was Justice White. He made the point that there are protections for intergovernmental exchanges that are, that are sensitive, that might give rise to a concern. But in relation to the minutes, they were released to me that I, that I originally requested. And, and, uh, there are a number of organisations, journalists, uh, NGOs, people who are trying to get access to want to see what's happened inside the National Cabinet, now getting frustrated by an official. Okay, because now every one of those decisions, because uh, she's ignored them, because she's incompetent and she's politicised, now have to go through a process that will take a year. It will take a year because your government hasn't properly resourced the office of the Australian Information Commissioner. When the Labor Party set up that office, there were three commissioners, the Information Commissioner, the FOI Commissioner and the Privacy Commissioner. And Tony Abbott tried to defund the whole organisation. We were left with one, and that was the Information Commissioner, trying to do the work of three. Finally, with some arm twisting, I've managed to help get us an FOI Commissioner, but we're still without a Privacy Commissioner. That whole organisation is underfunded because the whole plan of government is FOI request, we make a cavalier claim, goes to the Information Commissioner, Two years later, an answer pops out. If you still need to delay it beyond the election, you appeal it to the AAT at, at uh, taxpayers' expense. It's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. And the fact that Miss Angie McKenzie is in on it is, is just disgusting. And that's why I am calling her out. That's why I am calling it out. Now, you understand as well, Senator Van, that. that Parliamentary privilege allows me. It's not. It's not my privilege. It's a pr privilege of my constituents that allow me to say in this chamber what people can't say outside of it. That's a really important democratic principle. You need to understand exactly how this thing works and why it's important. Have you just not listened to the leader of the government and the leader of the opposition in the Senate? No, you didn't listen to them, did you? They were just talking about the importance of parliamentary privilege. You ought to understand it. You ought to, ought to respect what happens in this place. Okay? This is absolutely a disgrace. There's no other word for it. The government uh, has directed an official to apply secrecy in contravention to the ruling of a judicial officer. I've never seen that before, and I think it breaks the rule of law. Thank you, Senator Patrick, and I'll remind you in future to direct all of your comments to the chair. Thank you. Um, Senator Farrell. Uh, thank oh, you. I beg your pardon, I need to put the question, sorry. <laughs> so the question is that the um, motion is moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Sorry, Senator Farrell, you, this is like your third time jumping up, so I went to third you. Time, third <laughs> time lacking, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to the questions asked by Senators Smith that is uh, Mario Smith, uh, Wong and Grogan. Um, <clears throat> Deputy President, uh, I want to speak about the uh, lies of the, uh, of the Prime Minister that we've uh, seen in uh, recent months, but in particular in recent, uh, recent days. Um, we all, we all know, know about the, uh, the Prime Minister's um, ability to uh, bend the, the, the truth. We saw it first um, with simple things like um, his football team. Um, he claims that he was a Cronulla Sharks uh, supporter when we know all along he was in fact a, a rugby union um, <clears throat> supporter. Now, I know you come from Western Australia and uh, union and league are not particularly uh, strong sports over there, but in <clears throat> New South Wales and Queensland, these are important distinctions and for the the Prime Minister to mislead um, the Australian people about who he really supports and, uh, and, 
who his, uh, his uh, football team is, is, uh, is very worrying. And of course, <clears throat> it went further, much further, of course, during the period of the sports rorts uh, scandal. You'll be very familiar with that, Deputy President, where we had the color-coded document and documents being transferred uh, between Senator McKenzie <clears throat> and the Prime Minister uh, to hand out funds that were supposed to be for women's uh, sports um, around the countryside directed to marginal seats that the government were, were, was, was trying to win. But <clears throat> there's been a more recent big lie um, from, the, from the Prime Minister, and I want to talk about that. And that, that's in the form of the, the legislation that's going to come forward to us one of these days about voter identification, the, the so-called voter integrity um, law. Now, the big lie, what's the big lie here? Well, the big lie is uh, that there is something wrong with the Australian electoral system, that there are all these um, people out in the community who at election time are multiple voters. Now, it simply is not true, Madam Deputy uh, President. Um, at the last election, uh, there was a total of 2,000 people who voted more than once. So out of a population of almost 16 million people who voted at the last election, um, there was only 2,000 people who voted more than once. And the evidence from the Australian Electoral Commission uh, is that most of those people who voted uh, more than once were over the age of 80, and uh, in many cases, English was a second language. Um, we do not have a problem with multiple voting in this country. Uh, in fact, the um, commissioner, the AEC commissioner, um, in evidence recently in the estimates process, described the issue as vanishingly small. So why is it, um, <clears throat> Madam Deputy President, that we find that the Prime Minister says that that problem requires every single Australian 16 million voters likely at the next election uh, to come along on, at, uh, on election day and, uh, and show some form of identification. Now, for 120 years, uh, Madam uh, Deputy President, Australians have got themselves on the electoral roll. Um, they've come along on election day. They've uh, queued up, perhaps had a sausage like we had this morning with the uh, uh, protest uh, outside the front of uh, parliament and got their name struck off, been given a ballot paper and go along and vote. Now, for the first time in our electoral history, 16 million people are going to be required to produce some identification before they're allowed to vote. Now, why would you do this? So, one of the consequences, one of the clear consequences of that, of course, is you're going to be spending a lot more time at the, uh, at the polling booth, perhaps double, perhaps three times as much time as uh, you're spending at the moment. Why on earth, in the period of the worst uh, pandemic in Australian history, where you're trying to keep social distancing, why on earth uh, would you um, want to keep people at the polling booth longer than absolutely is required to exercise their democratic vote? Well, I'll tell you the answer, Deputy President. This government is so worried about the next election, so worried about their polling results, that they want to suppress Australian voting numbers. They don't want anybody who's likely to vote for them, against them. Thank you, Senator uh, Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Bragg. Deputy President, very much. Uh, I rise to take note of the answers today and uh, with reference to the uh, electoral law amendments that are before this particular chamber. And there are many bills which are before the parliament which have been drafted up in response to, to JSCM inquiries or the inquiry into the, the last federal election. Uh, I mean, and there is no question that over the long run uh, the expectation that people wouldn't have to provide any sort of ID at a polling place, I think, is really out of date and out of touch. Um, during this pandemic, Australians have become so used to or accustomed to 
providing some form of ID. Uh, Senator Bragg, if I might just remind you, I appreciate uh, Senator Farrell did make reference to yep. the electoral laws, and he probably overstated that. But the, I'm listening to where you're going with this. But the, the questions asked of Labor senators by Senators Smith, Wong, and Grogan went to examples of where the Prime Minister has said one thing and then later said another thing. So that's really the characterisation of those three questions. And um, Senator Farrell was using the voter laws as a reference. And I appreciate he did go on a little, but as he only had 30 seconds to go, I, I, I allowed that through. But. Okay. Well, thank you, Deputy President. Um, my, I was here for the last few minutes of the statement, and yep. I think it was all about the electoral amendment. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to talk about anything, uh, but in relation to uh, in integrity uh, in, in government. And I think that's where you're wanting to go here. Um, I mean, I, I, look, much has been said about these commissions and, and what sort of arrangements we should have in Canberra. Um, I don't think that calling it an integrity commission is the way to go. Um, I'm much more of the view that um, it should be focused on corruption and I would be minded to call it a anti-corruption commission. Um, and that's what I think it should be focused on, any form of corruption. I think people have different definitions of integrity, and integrity is important in government. And there are institutions which are in operation all the time, which ensure that there is scrutiny of government. And in fact, the Senate plays a very important role here, because the Senate runs the estimates process. The Senate runs committees of inquiry. Um, the COVID-19 select committee, although I haven't been a member of that committee, I think has done some important work over the course of this pandemic. Uh, and it, it has brought to light matters of public interest through its public hearings and through its submissions process uh, on the vaccination program on border matters, really material matters. So I, I would be of the view that the Victorian model uh, would be a, a preferable model for us to have in Canberra as opposed to the New South Wales model. But I wouldn't call it Integrity Commission. I'd be calling it a anti-corruption commission. My understanding of this is that under the Victorian model, there is a process where a brief of evidence needs to be established before coercive powers uh, are deployed. Uh, and I think that is a reasonable proposition. I think a reasonable body of work should be done uh, before anything else occurs. Um, um, Senator Bragg, I'm sorry hello. to interrupt you again, but nice to see you. the three questions um, from Labor senators, from Senator Smith, Wong and Grogan, uh, went to the Prime Minister. They were focused on the Prime Minister. That's, okay. and, and comments he had made and then later made a different um, comment about. So. Okay. Right. Well, as I say, um, I think you're talking about matters of integrity here. Yes, so it I've certainly is about integrity. Referred to and that integrity was focused on the Prime Minister. Voter integrity or whether it's, um, it's been um, matters of how we ensure that there is uh, confidence in our system of government. Um, I don't think that getting into uh, personal attacks is the way to go, and I won't be engaging in that sort of business here. Uh, and I think that that only diminishes the public debate here. And um, you know, I don't think this is a, a partisan comment to make at all. But I think if if you look at the way that, that question time runs here or in the House, I mean, it really is low rent stuff, and um, I think it is a poor reflection on us as an institution. Um, it is way too scripted, um, and all this this personal attack stuff. I don't I don't think does anything for anyone. Um, I would say though that um, I've been very impressed with the work done by the Senate committees. Um, I've been very impressed with the the quality of the public servants that run these particular uh, secretariats, and in my experience. The Senate committees take the Senate 
and therefore the Australian people into places that um, other institutions don't go. And we are able to hear people's voices. And so I do think that we do incredible work here on behalf of the Australian people. But I don't think that we are, we are, we are focusing on the right stuff when we are engaging in endless personal attacks. I mean, there of course is a role to look at people's public records and what they say, but I don't think that getting into personal attacks is the way to go, and I, I won't be engaging in that. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Um, Senator Mariel Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. It's always um, a delight to follow Senator Bragg. That was quite the ride uh, through the different areas you thought we were talking about, but thank you for your contribution. Um, I do just want to, to go to one of Senator Bragg's points. Uh, it's a point raised in question time as well in response to the questions asked by me and other Labor senators. And that was the, the government accusing us of engaging in personal attacks. And I want to lend my support to what Senator Bragg has said. Of course, there is no room for personal, personal attacks on individual senators in this place. But these are questions not of personal attacks. They're not questions of personality. They go to questions of integrity. They go to questions about the way the government is run and what diminishes the debate in this country as well as personal attacks on individuals is dishonesty, dishonesty in the public discourse. And that's why we we're asking these questions. That's why we were prosecuting these questions. Because from this Prime Minister, we've seen a pattern of dishonesty since he's taken the Prime Ministership, and indeed perhaps long before that too. A pattern of dishonesty, which goes to a question of integrity, which runs through the heart of how this government is run, which goes to the heart of how this government deals with issues of accountability, which goes to the heart of how this government approaches issues of scrutiny. So they're relevant questions, and I don't think it's fair to say that it diminishes the debate. It's the dishonesty which diminishes the debate. And in question time today, when we ask these questions, when we pose these questions about the mistruths told by the Prime Minister, we saw members of the government wilt, delicate as flowers, so sensitive, so delicate, so delicate couldn't even answer the questions. And I get why you feel a little delicate, little petals, because you feel scammed too. You feel scammed by this Prime Minister. Because you had one bloke once, right? He was Prime Minister. And then you had another bloke who wanted to be Prime Minister. You guys weren't too keen on him. So you sort of looked through the, through the ranks of you and got the guy from marketing, and you gave him a crack. Only to learn that when, uh, when the one thing you thought he was good at, marketing and spin, he can't actually prosecute. He's missing the point of marketing, right? Brand consistency. Brand consistency. If you're a good marketer, you've got to be able to run with brand consistency, which means you've got to have a consistent message in what you're selling. You've got to have a consistent message. And the Prime Minister can't get his story straight about anything in question time. He can't even get his story straight in question time on one issue. And then he has to come back when no one's looking, no one's in the chamber, because that would be pretty embarrassing for the Prime Minister, and correct the record. Correct the record. It's, uh, it, it's, it's interesting for a marketing guy. It's interesting, right, if you can't handle that. So I get why you're feeling a little delicate. I get why you're feeling a little delicate and a little precious about these questions, because you feel ripped off. You feel ripped off that you went to the dude for marketing and he can't even do that job properly. Pretty disappointing. But this Prime Minister, he cannot tell the truth. He cannot tell the truth. And he falls over himself. He can't even tell the truth about telling the truth. But that's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. But worse than being embarrassing is it goes to issues of integrity. And that's why it's perfectly reasonable for us to raise these questions in question time, when it goes to integrity, when it goes to accountability, when it goes to scrutiny. And this government seems allergic to all of those things, allergic to scrutiny, allergic to accountability. You let mistruth run through the heart of your government. And in this place, in this chamber, I agree, Senator Bragg, 
we should hold ourselves to a higher standard than others, which means it's more than appropriate for us to call that dishonesty out, for us to call out the examples, not just the one I referred to in my question to the minister representing the prime minister in this place, but also to the questions Senator Grogan asked about Ms Holgate, also to the questions that Senator Wong asked about the prime minister's dealings with the president of France. Indeed, ask him about how he feels about the prime minister's integrity. These are legitimate questions, accountability, scrutiny. I appreciate you feel a bit delicate in answering them, but it's more than reasonable that we pose them. Thank you, Senator Smith. Your time has expired. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I assure Senator Smith, Senator Mariel Smith, that I'll be anything but delicate in this. Because what we've seen today is marketing spin at its greatest. We've seen the Labor Party have their marketing plans exposed in the parliament by Senator Birmingham after the attacks from those on opposite, and now these questions in take note, that they are going to go after the Prime Minister, that they are going to highlight that he has been slow and late on vaccines, climate change bushfires and financial support for Victoria. Well, let me set the record straight on this, because we're anything but slow or late on any of these. So, in November 5th last year, the Prime Minister put out an announcement that we, he had already ordered 135 million doses of vaccine, more than f uh, enough for five doses for every Australian. And then last week, the Victoria, my home state, Premier Andrews says in the media that, uh, he, that uh, the Prime Minister forgot to order vaccines. Now, we know that's a lie. We know that the, the Premier of Victoria lied on that. So, as a, on the 21st of February this year, the Prime Minister announced that the Australian government had a comprehensive plan to, and I'm quoting here, has a, a comprehensive plan to offer COVID-19 vaccines to all Australians by the end of October 2021. And I think we've seen by the end of October, or maybe a day or two after, that was done. We hit 80 per cent vaccinated. It's more than 91 per cent of the eligible population over 16 are now protected. No one said that the rollout of the vaccine had to be a linear line, that it had to be straight. Of course it's going to ramp up. We had no vaccine. There were countries that demanded vaccine and needed vaccine higher than we did, and they got it. But we met our promise to the Australian people. The Prime Minister made a promise to the Australian people, and we met it. Now, our record on the vaccine roll, it is rollout is better than that in the UK, better than the US, better than in New Zealand. So with more vaccines going into arms every day, it's likely that we'll overtake more vaccines. Now the Labor Party, their position on vaccines is woeful. The Labor Party has endorsed the candidate for the seat of Higgins, who spent all of last year and most of this year putting, um, putting out misinformation, creating vaccine hesitancy about the AstraZeneca vaccine where she said it's a population level experiment which has high stakes attached to it. Personally, I'm not comfortable with that approach at all. She also said there is a possibility that the AstraZeneca vaccine will be rolled out to 10 million adults. We still might be being, being vulnerable when we relax our international borders. Now, we know that's not true. We know that's not true. Would uh, the, uh, candidate, the Labor candidate for Higgins, would she have voted with uh, Pauline's One Nation yesterday. Sounds like it from this. She's promoted vaccine hesitancy all the way through. So we can see that Labor has had a really ordinary run on that. Bush, the financial support for Victoria. I'm happy to talk to that. The Morrison government has provided over $4 billion to Victoria through COVID uh, economic support. That is more per capita than any other state in the country. Um, Senator Van, I'm also going to remind you that the questions today um, from Senators Smith, Wong and Grogan went to uh, the Prime Minister. Oh, and I'm answering that. I'm answering that. Uh, thank you. I am, I'm happy to take that point of order because I'm being directly relevant. I'm addressing each one of these. You were. And you I am, am addressing, I'm correcting the Senator, record. Senator Van, 
I, I'm, it's not an argument. I'm simply directing you to the questions that were asked by Labor senators. You started off on track, uh, but uh, over the last um, 30 or 40 seconds, you've gone off track, and I'm simply pointing to you that what the, what the comments were. And now, Senator Smith. Madam President, in a contribution of five minutes, I think going off the track for 30 to 40 seconds does not warrant All an right. interver Senator intervention Smith, by the chair. It's not a debating point. I'm simply directing the senator to uh, the take note questions. Thank you, Senator Van. Chair, you know, that's exactly what I'm doing. Labor is attacking the Prime Minister on a record that cannot be attacked. He's done exactly what he said he would do and what we would do. We said we'd take on climate change. I'm going to again to your document, the one that you're all clearly following in the chamber today. We're going to see for the next two weeks and until the election. You're clearly going to go after the Prime Minister. This is clearly your tactic, to your point, Madam Deputy President. This is your tactic that I'm correcting the record on. We said we'd take we went to the election, we said we'd take a target. 26 to 28 per cent as our Paris target for our N N NCD, um, and we are on track to meet that. The Prime Minister is keeping his promise on that. He's keeping his promise on meeting and beating the Paris target. We've already projected that we'll hit 35 per cent. So every one of your points in your marketing plan, when Senator Smith talks about marketing and spin, we can see yours. We can see straight through your tactics. It's not going to work. The people of Australia are not going to believe it, aren't going to stand for it, and you, you will see the results in Thank the you, election Senator next Van, year. Senator time has expired. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, Senator Van, we will hold the Prime Minister to account for his lack of integrity, and we will continue to do that. The pattern appears to be say something misleading, duck, weave, obfuscate, and then dig your heels in when you're called out on it. We saw just yesterday in the other place, when asked about his infamous trip to Hawaii, the Prime Minister told the parliament that he had, he had sent a text message to the leader of the opposition telling him where he was going. That is not true. It's very untrue. What he said was he was going on leave. Leave is not a destination. But <laughs> uh, Senator Van, I'd ask you to withdraw that. Thank you. Senator Grogan. Anthony Albanese did receive a text. That is true. But it did not mention where the Prime Minister was going. It did not mention his tropical destination. It did not mention that he was travelling overseas, a point that you think would be rather relevant. But what's astounding here is that this was unprompted. There was no reason to even mention that text message, none whatsoever. But when facing some political hot water, again, a duck, a weave, an obfuscation, trying to get around a particular point, the Prime Minister brought this text message up of his own volition and then inappropriately and inaccurately referenced it. What I also find very interesting here is that the political gain that could have occurred or the personal gain that could have occurred by Anthony Albanese actually declaring that he had received it was not used at all. Anthony Albanese has a deep integrity and sees very clearly that a personal message, a private message, is just that and did not mention it. And that was two years ago. In two years, he has not brought it up. The contrast could not be bigger here between these two people. We have, we have Anthony Albanese not mentioning these texts because private correspondence should be private. And then we have the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, making really, really poor calls with some of these things. We only have to look at this disastrous diplomatic experience with the French president um, leaking those text messages. The leader of one country, of this country, leaking a text message, a private text message from the leader of another country. This is just woeful. 
the lack of integrity, significant, serious lack of integrity of the person who we have leading this country is despicable. How on earth are the Australian people supposed to trust him? And then we have the whole saga with um, former Australia Post chief executive Christine Holgate. Mr Morrison set up a chain of events in question time that ended with the highly regarded chief executive being forced out of her position, costing taxpayers more than a million dollars when she was awarded a termination payment. The Prime Minister attempted to gaslight the nation, making out like Ms Holgate had left the organisation of her own volition. She did not. We had the whole Brian Houston fiasco, where the PM tried to get his mate into an official White House function, and even the Trump administration wouldn't have him. And the lies that went on after that, where the Prime Minister just said he hadn't done it. When it finally came out in the American press that he had, he had absolutely tried to get his mate in. He then had to backtrack, duck, weave, backtrack and find some way of wriggling out of it. His commentary was, I don't comment on gossip or stories about other stories. That's hardly integrity for the people of Australia. He then went on that he just didn't want to be distracted by it. The true answer is he didn't want to answer the question. He didn't want to provide that clarity and honesty to the people of Australia. And he then said that at the end of the day, it was not a significant matter. I beg to disagree. And he finished it off by saying, people have not asked me about it for months. Does that make it not an important issue? I think when it comes to the integrity of the Prime Minister of this country, I would fundamentally disagree. Are there any further contributions? Senator Cox? Yes. <laughs> that, uh, we take, the Senate takes note of questions to Senator Birmingham from various senators. Those that opinion say aye, against say no, the ayes have it. Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Mr President. I move that the Senate take note of Minister Rustin's response to my questions. Um, the Woodside approval of the Scarborough gas project, it's a dark and devastating day for our climate, our planet and our future. And, and as a mother of, of two daughters, I, I, sh I shudder to think what that means for our future, for our children in 2030, uh, when we have projects like this that are being funded, encouraged and endorsed by governments of this country. This pollution that the Scarborough Pluto project is equal to 15 coal-fired power stations every single year, not over the life of the project, every single year of that project. The emissions from this facility equal around 5 per cent of the current total emissions every year in WA. This is greenwashing, greenwashing of what Woodside have put out. And the scientific evidence is pretty clear that this project is actually going to be worse than Adani. It's devastating both for our climate, it's devastating for our marine life. This project is going to impact on the coral reefs, the whales and their migration pattern, the turtles and the dugongs in this area. It's devastating for traditional owners of that country who are trying to protect country. And as a First Nations person who's walked on that country. It is devastating. It is devastating for their water sources, their traditional foods that they rely on in this area, and that Scarborough will further destroy the Murrajulga area's world's largest and oldest collection of First Nations rock art. And this includes the first ever recording of a human face. It's quite significant in this area because it's nowhere else, nowhere else in this country. We have one of the oldest living cultures in the world, and still we don't respect, we don't want to protect, and we certainly 
So I want to make sure that it doesn't get ruined by development and mining and the resources sector that uh, our governments protect. This is also being considered for World Heritage listing. Hundreds of these rock carvings have already been destroyed, have already been removed for gas development. So the ones that are there, we need to save. The rock art that's been eaten away is being eaten away by highly acidic gases that are being released from this existing Pluto plant that's already there. And sadly, this is going to be expanded. It's been expanded because it was approved yesterday. What's happening to the Marujuka art is being described as Duke and Gorge on slow motion. So not only is that uh, this rock art just lays out in the elements, it's not in caves, it's not in rock shelters, as it was in Jukun, but the importance of protecting that environment then from those gases is our responsibility, our collective responsibility. It's not just about the artwork, the rock art that exists there. This is the site of the Seven Sisters dreaming story, the song line that goes from the Murujuga area right across Central Australia, across this country. It tells the story of the first peoples of this country, which no one in this place respects, clearly, because they don't care. They keep approving for it to be destroyed. If you dig down in that country, you will be able to see the song line. You will be able to help the people of the Murujuga area to help recover and heal this place. But well, no, we're not doing that. We have built an agreement. And when they built this agreement with the traditional owners group of this area, they went to them and said, there's going to be a train here, just like Hammersley Iron have built. But no, this is a gas transporting uh, train. It's not an iron ore train. And still, we have Woodside that say, oh no, there's no direct impact on First Nations cultural heritage there. They haven't even updated their Section 18 approval since 2007. <laughs> this is cultural genocide in action, people. Absolutely. This is where we get our native title connection. We can prove our unbroken continuation to culture through cultural heritage. So how is it the Woodside are getting away with this? Well, no doubt it's about their dirty donations, and it's contrary to what the minister has said during question time, that these gas policies are being driven by big corporations like Woodside. Their donations is what they rely on, and just like the Northern Endeavour project, they will abandon them and we will cover the clean-up costs. This Senator has got Cox, risk, risk, risk written all over it. Your time has expired. The question is that the Senate take note of answers from Minister Rustin. Those of that opinion say aye. Can say no. The eyes have it.